Day 5. My disciples and Paul built their own edifice of sacred beliefs on what they wanted to preserve from my life and teachings. They only taught and consolidated what they deemed to be valuable to people, Jews and Gentiles alike, at that time and in the future. Consequently, they distilled what they could use and they let go most of what I term the secrets of the kingdom of God, for they never understood them, nor found them desirable in the creation of a new perception of the divine, the Father. To preserve the Jewish belief in salvation from punishment for sins by means of sacrifice in the temple, the person of Jesus was adapted as the supreme sacrifice who had paid for men's sins by my crucifixion. This belief served many purposes at that time. It gave my death on the cross a valid and heroic reason. It proved to the people that I was the Son of God who had carried out a specific mission to the very end of my life. This belief also proved to be of great comfort to Jews when their temple was destroyed by the Romans and led to many converts taking place. Many sects of Jews and Gentiles also did not believe did not believe in life after death. Consequently, it was greatly comforting to hear that Jesus Christ had overcome death and retained his body. To much human thought at that time, life was not possible without a body. Therefore, life after death could only mean the resurrection of the body. <coughs> it also kept my name constantly alive in the minds of people. I was the historic figure who had valiantly died to ensure that men should be freed of all fear of hell and damnation. Providing they believed in me, they could walk as freed men. It is only because of my name has been kept alive to this very day that I am now able to come to you and give you of the truth I so dearly wanted to share with people over 2,000 years ago. Number 7. My early life and experiences in the desert. I was born in Palestine. My mother was convinced that I would be a, a messiah. Contrary to popular belief, I was not a saintly child. When taken to the temple, aged 12 years old, to be interviewed by the chief priests to determine where whether I would be fit to enter Jewish religious training, I was rejected as being too opinionated. Bitterly disappointed, my mother took me home again and did her best to raise me in the sanctity which marked her own demeanor at all times. This was an impossible task for I was, above all things, an individualist and unruly in behavior. I resented my mother's guidance and her attempted discipline. As a youth, I became unmanageable, a true rebel. I rejected my mother's staunch adherence to the Jewish faith and traditions, preferring laughter to sanctimonious attitudes. I refused to learn a trade which would have bound me down to routine. I chose to mix with all and sundry of the poorer classes drunk with them, knew prostitutes, and enjoyed talking, arguing, laughing, and being bone idle. When I needed money, I went into the vineyards for a day or two or took other jobs paying me enough to eat and drink and give me the leisure I craved. For all my many shortcomings as a human being, my careless, easy, indolent attitudes, my self-will and egocentric determination to think my own thoughts irrespective of what others might try to tell me, I cared about people very deeply. I was deeply emotional. In your present speech forms, you would call me overreactive, over-emotional. I had a warm, compassionate, empathetic heart. 
I was deeply moved in the presence of sickness, affliction, and poverty. I was a staunch supporter of what you call the underdog. You might say I was a people's person. I lived with them closely in a spirit of camaraderie. I listened to their woes, understood, and cared. It is important to understand my true origins and my early youthful characteristics because these were the goads which pushed and prodded me into eventual Christhood. What I most strongly detested and resisted was the misery, the sickness and poverty I saw around me. It infuriated me and I became passionately, vociferously angry to see people dressed in rags, thin and hungry, deceased, crippled, yet heartlessly browbeaten by Jewish leaders who burdened them with meaningless traditional laws and observances, threatening them with Jehovah's punishment if they, if they did not obey. I, decla I declared to all who would listen to me that these poor, poor people had enough to bear without being crushed by senseless measures restrictive of pleasure. What was the point of life at all if we were not born to be happy? I refused to believe in a just God according to Jewish traditions. The biblical prophetic warnings of Jehovah's judgment and anger against people disgusted me. People were human, after all, doing whatever their human natures prompted them to do. They had been born sinful, so why should they be judged and condemned to lives of suffering and poverty because they had broken the Ten Commandments? Where was the sense in such statements? To me, this Jewish belief depicted an illogical, cruel God, and I wanted nothing to do with Him. It seemed to me that if such a deity existed, it followed that mankind was doomed to eternal misery. The simplicity and freedom I found on the hillsides, the plains, the lakes, and the mountains refreshed my inmost spirit and quietened my angry murmuring against the Jewish God. Consequently, I refused to believe a word that the Jewish elders tried to teach me. However, during my middle twenties, a new line of questioning took possession of my thoughts. As I walked ever more frequently alone in the hills, my rebellion was gradually replaced by an, by an all-consuming longing to know and understand the true nature of that which, which must surely inspire and respire through creation. I reviewed my lifestyle and saw what suffering my actions had caused my mother and many other people. Although I felt such deep compassion for the weak and suffering, my rebellious nature had prompted much thoughtless and selfish behavior towards my family. My underlying love for them now welled up in me, and I found myself becoming equally rebellious against my past behavior. I heard talk about John the Baptist and the work he was doing amongst the Jews who came to listen to his words even from Jerusalem. I decided to visit him to be baptized myself. On my way to the River Jordan, I felt exhilarated at the prospect of being baptized and starting a new life. I knew that, despite my unruly emotionalism, I had also been born with a keen intelligence and a gift for insightful, impressive debate which I had used willfully and negatively, leading people into unruly arguments. I had thrown my talents away by pursuing a life of self-will, idleness, and pleasure. As a result, I had forfeited all respect from others. Neither did I possess any self-respect. For the first time, I found this to be intolerable. It occurred to me that, in the future, I could and must put my natural gifts to better use. Instead of just making a noise, perhaps I could find a way to lighten the burdens of those whom I so deeply pitied. pitied. Up to that time, I had been of little practical use to anyone. Number 8. My Baptism When I entered the water in the River Jordan to be baptized by John, 
I expected to feel nothing more than relief that I had, for once, taken a positive step in reforming my behavior. I expected to feel a new determination to go home and astonish my mother and neighbors with my new kindly attitudes towards them. What really happened when John baptized me was an experience completely different to anything I had ever thought possible. I felt a great wave of tremendous energy surge through my body. I was literally stunned by it. As I staggered out of the river, I felt myself elevated in consciousness in a most extraordinary way. A great inflow of glowing happiness uplifted me to a state of ecstasy. I was enraptured and aware of a great light. Stumbling, I moved away from the river and walked and walked, not knowing where I was going. I continued on, unseeingly, into the desert. Please note, my six weeks in the desert were a time of total inner cleansing of my human consciousness. Old attitudes, beliefs, and prejudices were dissolved. The time has come for me to share with receptive people all that I felt, saw, realized, and understood. To help people abandon the age-old imaginative pictures of a biblical deity, I will avoid referring to God by that word and will use a terminology designed to stretch your minds, to embrace what really is beyond all earthly form, color, sound, emotion, and comprehension. This terminology will become ever more meaningful as you persevere in meditation and prayer. Number 9. What I felt when in the desert. I was uplifted into inner radiant light and felt vibrant and wondrously alive with power. I was filled with ecstasy and joy and I knew beyond all doubt that this power was the true creator out of which all created things had been given their being. This glorious interior harmony, peace, and sense of perfect fulfillment, needing nothing more to be added to that beautiful moment, was the very nature of the reality, the creative power, giving life to creation and existence. Number 10. What I saw, realized, perceived when in the desert. I was lifted into another dimension of conscious perception which enabled me to see the truth concerning life and existence. I saw, lucidly and clearly, what was real and what was false in man's thinking. I realized that this creative power I was experiencing was infinite, eternal, universal, filling all space beyond sky, oceans, earth, and all living things. I saw it was mind power. It was the creative power of mind. There was no point where this creative, where this divine creative power of mind was not. I realized that human mind was drawn from divine creative mind, but was only a candle lit by the sun. At times, my human sight was so spiritually heightened, I could see through rocks, earth, sun. This now appeared to be only a shimmer of tiny modes. I realized that nothing was really solid. When I had moments of doubt that this could be so, the changes in the phenomena stopped taking place, and much later I discovered that my thoughts, if strongly imbued with conviction, could effect changes in the shimmer of modes, what science presently calls electrically charged particles, and therefore produce changes in the appearance of the rock or whatever I was studying. It was at this point that I came to realize the powerful effect that conviction or unwavering faith had on the environment when stating a command or even a belief. What was even more startling was my mind opening, cosmic consciousness realization that all I had been witnessing was really the creative power of the divine mind itself made visible in the shimmer of tiny notes. Not only this, its appearance could be profoundly affected by the activity of human thought.